These are the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. You've no doubt heard of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which is a cornerstone of English literature. But to really enjoy these stories, we need to understand a little about the English language at the time these works were published. We also need to know something about English history and sociology so that these tales can be appreciated in context. First of all, English is roughly broken into three progressions. The first is called Old English, or Anglo-Saxon English. Old English is placed from about the year 600 to approximately 1100 A.D. The most famous piece of literature in Old English is Beowulf, which appeared about 1000 A.D. The language of Old English reflects a European influence, especially Northern European and although we can understand some words of it, it really needs to be translated into modern English for us to follow the storyline. The second era of the English language is called Middle English. The Canterbury Tales is the greatest example of Middle English, which was in use from approximately 1100 to 1500. Although Middle English is much easier for us to understand than Old English is, there are spelling and grammatical differences that present difficulties to today's readers. For that reason, the Canterbury Tales is published in a translated form, not in its original words. Following Middle English is Modern English, which started about the year 1500 and continues to this day. Shakespeare's works are in Modern English. Of course, the shifts in the English language were gradual, with perhaps the greatest change between Old English and Middle. This transition was marked by the Norman conquest of England in 1066, and is manifested in a French influence on our language. Before we look at the author of the greatest piece of Middle English literature, we need to look at the late 1300s, the present tense for the Canterbury Tales. In the 1300s, England was caught between medieval thought and the beginning of Europe's Renaissance. In medieval times, citizens were expected to stifle self-expression and accept in full the laws of their church and their feudal masters. But with the Renaissance came a new idea, that the human being, not the system, was the best way to measure worth, and through individual expression and freedom a person could find their greatest happiness. This concept of human rights, one which we still grapple with 600 years later, posed a threat to the strength of the Catholic Church. And there were other signs of rebellion at that time. One of the most important was the Protestant Reformation when some people switched their allegiance from the corrupt Catholic Church to newer, less wealthy, but seemingly more spiritual religious organizations. And there were huge social changes as the feudal system ended. England was becoming a more united country, with increased trade and a rising middle class. The middle class was a brand new social class then, where previously there had been the wealthy and the poor. As we know, it's always a restless time when old social orders disintegrate and new ones struggle into existence. Another major force in England during the 1300s was the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death. The plague was felt throughout Europe, and it decimated England on more than one occasion. This was the England that Chaucer was born into, a country gripped by change. Now we'll tell you a little about Chaucer's life. He was born about 1342. His father and grandfather prospered in the wine business, and his mother had family connections in high government circles. In his early teens, Chaucer became a page to a noble family. This was a highly coveted apprenticeship, and he had the opportunity to do errands and wait on some of the most powerful and influential people in England. It also provided Chaucer with an opportunity to understand and practice the chivalrous manners that were a prerequisite to the aristocratic lifestyle. In 1359, Chaucer was sent to France with the English army. As England became a united country for the first time, it expressed its national identity by fighting the Hundred Years' War with France. Like many others, Chaucer fought and was taken prisoner. He was later ransomed, and the King of England contributed toward that. But Chaucer's time in France may have been an important part of his development as a poet. After his return home, Chaucer began to translate a famous French poem of courtly love. We should explain a bit about the tradition of courtly love, which was exalted during this era. It's best explained by using the example of chivalrous knights, like those in the time of King Arthur. The knight's chivalric code had as its goal that a person should love for love's sake. The knight who was willing to slay a dragon to uphold the honor of the lady he idealized and expected nothing in return but a smile of acknowledgement, that would be a knight who loves in the manner of courtly love. 
the poetry of courtly love was of great interest to Chaucer and probably affected his life and attitudes toward love and marriage. Courtly lovers never expected to find love in marriage, which was considered far too practical an arrangement to provide the noble inspiration that one idealized in an unattainable love object. So when Chaucer married a lady-in-waiting to the queen, around 1367, he probably saw it as a marriage of convenience that benefited both parties. Chaucer was soon in the English court and held a number of high-level jobs in royal service. His work enabled him to travel on trade missions, and he took a few trips to Italy where he had the opportunity to come in contact firsthand with the Renaissance. These travels must have delighted Chaucer, who was extremely well-educated and well-read. In addition to his literary accomplishments and translations, he was expert in physics, astronomy, and medicine. With his exposure to the court and his many travels, Chaucer had a tremendous wealth of experience. All these talents and his background were brought to bear in the Canterbury Tales, his diverse collection of stories from many times and places. For a few years in the late 1380s, Chaucer was out of favor with the court. Actually, this turned out to be a help, for it provided him with the time to work on the Canterbury Tales. Chaucer originally planned to write almost 120 tales, but he completed many less than that. His idea was that each of 29 pilgrims to Canterbury would tell two stories on their way to Canterbury and two stories on the way back. When Chaucer regained his favorable royal status in the 1390s, he wrote a few other works in addition to the Canterbury Tales. He lived comfortably until his death in the year 1400, leaving behind one of the most famous poems in the English language. Although students from all walks of life and in all kinds of schools read the Canterbury Tales, Chaucer's original audience was the elite society that he worked and lived in. Chaucer probably read the tales aloud to various court members as he wrote them. Like him, they would have understood his references to classical myth, his sprinkling of French and Latin words, and various literary formats that we no longer use. The Canterbury Tales were published after Chaucer's death, put together by editors who felt they would understand the sequence he wanted. Chaucer himself neither finished the tales nor revised the work he'd done. But the tales grew so popular in the telling that they're credited with forever changing the sound and appearance of the English language. And what was once a collection of tales for only the well-bred to appreciate is now something that anyone can read and understand even more than 600 years after they were first written. The Canterbury Tales starts with a prologue, which describes the setting of the story and the look of the characters. It starts, When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root, then people long to go on pilgrimages, and specially down to Canterbury. Now Chaucer describes the 29 people who make up the company of pilgrims. In this prologue, with its colorful descriptions of Chaucer's companions on the road to Canterbury, descriptions that include careers, habits, physical attributes, and attitudes of the time, we immediately appreciate the flavor of his era and his writing talents. He describes a knight. A most distinguished man, he was wise and in his bearing modest as a maid. Just home from service, he had joined our ranks to do his pilgrimage and render thanks. He had his son with him, a fine young squire, a lover, and a lad of fire, with locks as curly as if they had been pressed. These are only partial descriptions, of course, to give you a taste of Chaucer's poetry. The actual descriptions are paragraphs long, with a full outline of each character's background and plans for the journey. Chaucer himself is just another pilgrim, who goes with these twenty-nine and the innkeeper where they all meet. For our purposes, it would probably be best to describe the characters as they tell their tales. We don't have time to include all the tales, but we will give some important highlights. The knight is the first to entertain the group with a story. His tale is set in ancient Greece, but it has all the trappings of a chivalrous tale of knighthood. This is one of the most important aspects of the Canterbury Tales, that the stories the pilgrims share reveal as much about the teller as they do about the times. The knight's story goes like this. There was once a Greek lord named Theseus who had as his prisoners of war two young men, Palamon and Arcite. Theseus knew that they were noblemen, and he kept them comfortably in a tower. One day, Palamon looked through his prison window and saw Emily, the beautiful sister-in-law of Theseus. 
Palamon cried out at her beauty, causing Arcee to also look out. Arcee was so enamored of Emily that he said he would die if he could not see her every day. Palamon is furious at this, saying to Arcee that he saw her first. But Arcee says he loved Emily first, and the two friends became enemies. A mutual friend of Theseus and Arcite arranges for Arcite to be released under the condition that Arcite leave Theseus's kingdom immediately under pain of death. Arcite is anguished. He's afraid he'll never see Emily again. Palamon is concerned that Arcite will go and raise an army that can overpower Theseus, and then Arcite will gain Emily. For two years, Arcite remains in another country, and his grief over losing Emily changes his appearance so much that no one can recognize him. He returns to Athens and becomes a member of Theseus's court. Many years pass, and Arcite becomes Theseus's friend. Palamon finally escapes from his prison. Arcite and Palamon by chance discover each other and engage upon a bloody duel. They are found by the king, who is persuaded by the women in his court not to execute them. He frees them under one condition: they should go away, raise a troop of one hundred knights. And return in a year to fight each other in a huge joust. The winner would be given Emily's hand. While they're away, Emily prays to Diana, the goddess of chastity, that the two men not love her. And if she can't have that, Emily asks that the winner be the one who loves her most. Palamon also prays to a goddess, Venus, the goddess of love. He asks for possession of Emily. Arcite prays to Mars, the god of war, asking for victory in battle. They come to the Athens battlefield for the jousting contest, and it's a fierce battle. Palamon is seriously wounded and taken off the field. Arcite, riding in victory around the huge ring of spectators, is unexpectedly injured by his horse. Soon after, he dies, and Theseus joins Palamon and Emily in marriage. Stories of courtly love like this were very popular in England during Chaucer's time. The theme of chivalry is perfectly played out in the knight's tale. Unlike many of the stories to follow, the love of these characters is pure and noble, like the knight himself. Notice that the knight has a joust taking place in ancient Greece, which is impossible. But what a knight might invent! The lack of vulgarity in this story is a contrast to the extremes of sensuality and human weakness we'll hear in later stories, especially the next one, the Miller's Tale. In the prologue, Chaucer describes the Miller. The Miller was a chap of sixteen stone, a great stout fellow, big in brawn and bone. His beard, like any sow or fox, was red. At its very tip, his nose displayed a wart on which there stood a tuft of hair, red as the bristles in an old sow's ear. A wrangler and buffoon, he had a store of tavern stories, filthy in the main. His was a master hand at stealing grain. Indeed, the miller's story is well suited to a tavern. The miller drunkenly says that he can match the knight's tale, but before he starts, Chaucer, the narrator, advises that any readers who consider themselves saintly and well-bred may want to skip this tale and read another one instead. The miller says that there was once an old carpenter who lived in Oxford, married to an eighteen-year-old named Allison. They took in a young lodger named Nicholas, whose greatest talent was making love in secret. The young man seduces the young woman without any objection on her part, and they decide to play a trick on the old man. The fact that the young boarder only has to approach the wife to have an affair with him, there's no love to speak of between the two, is a typical medieval attitude towards women. There was a strong tradition of assuming that women were unfaithful towards their husbands and highly disposed to having affairs with whatever man presented himself to them. This is probably more a psychological projection by medieval authors than reality. The theme of the sluttish wife occurs in a majority of the Canterbury Tales, but its probability is questionable. It seems unlikely that English women of that time were as promiscuous and wanton as Chaucer and other authors make them out to be. So we can assume that their ideas about women are about as realistic as jousting in Greece. To return to our story. A parish clerk named Absalon also falls in love with Allison. Absalon is a finicky young man, almost effeminate in manner. He's very particular about manners and is especially offended by people with gas. Absalon sings beneath Allison's window one night to win her heart, but the carpenter isn't concerned because he can see that Allison isn't impressed by Absalon. 
Nicholas the Lodger convinces the old carpenter that he's had a true vision, a premonition of catastrophe. Nicholas says that soon they will be deluged with a flood, like Noah's biblical flood. This worries the old man, and Nicholas suggests that he take three little boats, rope them to the ceiling, and put in each boat an axe to cut the ropes. Then, when the flood comes, each person can cut the rope and float away safely. On the night before Nicholas predicted this flood, the old carpenter falls asleep in his boat, and Allison and Nicholas get out of their separate boats and go to bed together. While they're in the bedroom, Absalon comes to the outside window and asks Allison for a kiss. To keep him quiet, she agrees, but to make him stop, she offers her rear end instead of her lips. In the darkness of night, Absalon can't see that, and passionately kisses Allison's bottom. But he can tell by the touch what's happened to him, and is infuriated at the joke. Absalon goes to a blacksmith and borrows a red-hot poker. He comes back to Allison's window and begs for one more kiss. This time, Nicholas decides that he'll play an even better joke on Absalon, and puts his rear end out the window. Absalon says, "'Speak, pretty bird!' I know not where thou art. At this, Nicholas expels gas in such a loud way that Absalom is almost blinded, but Absalom recovers and puts the red-hot poker on Nicholas's rump. Nicholas screams, Water! Help! At these words, the carpenter awakens and thinks, Here comes Noah's flood! He cuts the ropes to his boat and crashes onto the floor. The neighbors come running at the sound and laugh at the carpenter's lunacy. The miller concludes, And every one among them laughed and joked, and so the carpenter's wife was truly poked, as if his jealousy to justify, and Absalom has kissed her nether eye, and Nicholas is branded on the bum, and God bring all of us to kingdom come. We have actually edited, and will continue to edit, some of the more bawdy references in Chaucer. His graphic stories in double entendres are as raunchy as any modern-day nightclub comic. In Chaucer's time, the facts of life played a great part in stories. The sexual satire continues in the next story, called The Reeve's Tale. In the prologue, the Reeve is described as old and thin. He manages a large estate, and his shrewdness in business dealings make him popular with his master, but unpopular with those who work for him. The Reeve was once a carpenter, and takes offense at the miller's tale, which ridicules a carpenter. For revenge, the Reeve tells an unflattering story about a miller. There once lived a miller in England, who made a good living by cheating his customers as he measured out grain. One night, he cheated two students by driving off their horse to distract them while he half-emptied their sacks of grain. By the time they'd caught their horse, it was dark. They asked if they might stay for the evening and offered to pay. The reeve gives the two young men one of the three beds in the common bedroom. The two boys have one bed, he and his wife have the second, and their twenty-year-old daughter has the third. One of the boys, in the middle of the night, gets in bed with the daughter. As in the other stories where women were assumed to be promiscuous, notice that the daughter agrees without comment to a strange man getting in her bed in the middle of the night. Later, the miller's wife goes to the bathroom and, on her return, mistakenly gets in bed with the other student. Both she and her daughter have sex with the two men. The next morning, the student who'd been in bed with the daughter goes back to what he thinks is his bed, but it's really the miller's, and thinking that he's talking to his friend, tells of his sexual exploits with the miller's daughter. The miller wakes up enraged, and his wife, thinking that the man beside her is her husband, mistakes the shouting miller for one of the students and hits her husband with a club. The students flee, grabbing along the way the extra grain the miller had tried to cheat from them. This story has a certain slapstick humor, and, like the miller's tale that preceded it, a humor of a sort. Most of Chaucer's tales have a moral, and so provide little lessons in the consequences of sin. The next full story is from a character called The Man of Law. The Man of Law says that he can't tell his story in rhyme, the others are rhymed poems, but will tell a simple story simply. He says that there was once a young sultan from Syria who heard of Constance, the beautiful daughter of Rome's emperor, and said to be the perfect woman. The sultan wanted to marry her, but his advisers said that he, as a Muslim, couldn't marry a Christian. 
the Sultan decides that he and all his subjects will be baptized as Christians. This angers the Sultan's mother, who doesn't want her son to give up their religion. Constance's father then arranges the marriage. Note that the woman has no say in this, just as Emily in the Knight's Tale was given to the winner of a joust. This was a fact of life in medieval times. As Constance prepares sadly to leave her home to marry the Sultan, the Sultan's mother plans to slay everyone at the wedding feast in revenge for having another religion forced on them. When Constance and her court arrive in Syria, there's a tremendous reception that bedazzles her and makes her happy in Syria and with her new husband. After the wedding, as the court sits down for a banquet, the rebels come in and kill everyone but Constance. She's put on a little ship and cast to sea. Her ship finally beaches on England, a pagan land in ancient times. The Christian is given shelter by a couple who soon discover Constance's beautiful character and deep religious faith. They become Christians, too. But one night, the devil takes the disguise of a knight and murders the lady of the house. He slits her throat and puts the knife in Constance's bed. When the dead woman's husband returns home, he finds the murder and murder weapon and takes Constance before the king. The king wants to sentence Constance to death, but the women of the court protest. The devil, still in the guise of a knight, is asked if he killed the woman. He denies it and is struck dead. And a voice says aloud that a disciple of Christ, meaning Constance, has been falsely judged. Everyone in the court is astonished at the miracle and accepts the Christian faith. The use of miracles as proof of Christianity has been a tradition since its beginnings and the basis of a number of the Canterbury Tales. The king falls in love with Constance and they marry. But the king's mother doesn't like this, and when Constance gives birth to a beautiful son while the king was away at war, the king's mother writes him a letter saying that the baby is deformed. The king writes back, accepting this as the will of God, but his mother replaces his letter with another one, an order to have the son destroyed. Instead, Constance takes her son and sails away to safety and freedom. When the king returns and discovers his mother's treachery, he puts her to death. Constance returns to Rome, but she's lost her memory in grief and misfortune and doesn't recognize her home. Her husband, the king, makes a pilgrimage to Rome and by chance sees a little boy who looks like Constance. He goes to Constance's home, tells her what his mother did, and they're joyously reunited. Constance regains her memory and goes to the emperor, her father, to let him know she's still alive. This tale is based on an earlier story by an English historian. As with many of Chaucer's tales, they aren't new, but are being retold and refined. In this one, we see an example of the Christian medieval ideal. Constance is the perfect woman, a willing martyr to her faith if needs be, and a shining example of Christian humility and faith. The lack of logic in these stories, their very implausibility, supports the Christian tradition that demands unquestioning faith from church members. To continue along this line of Christian religious belief, we hear the prioress's tale. In the prologue, the prioress is described as a fine lady with dainty manners, entertaining and friendly ways, and a sentimental heart. She is clearly a wealthy and well-educated woman who's also a nun. Before the prioress begins, she invokes the presence of God and the Virgin Mary in a hymn of praise. Then she begins a story which is anti-Semitic. However, in Chaucer's time, there was a widespread distrust of Jews. The kind of story the prioress tells was a common legend, told with different embellishments for many centuries. It also is a typical Catholic martyr story, and in that respect resembles stories taught to little children for almost two thousand years. There was once a Christian town in Asia, and in the town there was a neighborhood where the Jews lived. On the border between the Jewish neighborhood and the Christian neighborhood was a school for Christians. One of the students was a little boy so young he couldn't even read. But the boy loved a song he'd heard at school, a song that praised the Virgin Mary. It was a Latin hymn, and he memorized the song at great difficulty to himself. He would sing it out loud every day as he walked through the Jewish neighborhood on his way to school. But Satan said to the Jewish people in the neighborhood that the boy was singing the song to spite them and show disrespect to their holy laws. 
they hired a murderer who slit the throat of the little boy and threw him in a pit. Chaucer uses a famous phrase here, after the boy is murdered, to reassure the reader that justice will prevail. He writes, Murder will out, and nothing can prevent God's honor spreading. The little boy's mother, knowing that her son was last seen in the Jewish neighborhood, goes there, but no one will help her. Finally, with the inspiration of Jesus, she goes to the pit where the child was thrown. From the ground comes the boys singing, and all the Christians gather to hear the miracle of the child's voice singing in praise of the Virgin Mary through the ground. The boy's body is dug up and he's dead, but his singing doesn't stop. A monk finally brings peace to the child's body and he's laid to rest. Those guilty of his murder are drawn apart by horses and then hanged. Although the Catholic Church is no longer anti-Semitic per se, all stories about martyrs are based on the view that to not be a Catholic is to be anti-Catholic or anti-God. This kind of adversarial attitude is the basis for religious wars like the Crusades and even today in bloody conflicts throughout the world. The Christian and Islamic religions seem to have an either-or attitude that provokes conflict, and stories such as these Canterbury Tales teach people to hold on to their prejudices down through the ages. To return to our Canterbury pilgrims, the innkeeper asks Chaucer, What man are you, scanning the ground with such a steady stare? Look up merrily, say something, and let it be a tale of mirth. Unfortunately, Chaucer's tale is an absurd knightly poem with annoying rhymes and cliché situations. No doubt Chaucer was having a joke at his own expense by making himself one of the most boring storytellers in the group. Chaucer is finally interrupted and asked to concede the floor to someone else. He concedes it to a monk, described in the prologue as a worldly man who loves good food, hunting, and company. This monk doesn't much care for the quiet life of the monastery. Even though the monk is asked to tell a happy story, he repeats one tragic fable after another. He starts with the downfall of Adam and follows it with the tragedy of Samson. In addition to biblical stories, the monk tells stories from Greek and Roman history, all boring and disheartening. Finally, the knight asks the monk to stop. The innkeeper asks the priest, who's been in the company of the prioress, to give a tale. He obliges with one of the liveliest tales, a story that finds its roots in animal legends like Aesop's fables, and continues today in the French classic The Little Black Rooster and other children's stories. Once upon a time, a widow lived with her daughters in a country cottage. They had many animals, but their favorite was a rooster named Chanticleer. Chanticleer was vain about his dynamic crow and had a harem of seven hens. One spring morning, Chanticleer complained that he had had a nightmare of being chased by some kind of beast. The beast looked like a fox. One of the hens tells him he's a coward to be afraid of dreams and suggests that indigestion caused the nightmare. She offers to make him a laxative. Chanticleer tells her that there are many stories that support the authenticity of dreams. He gives her examples, including the biblical story of Joseph in Egypt, to finish his lordly dissertation, he misquotes a Latin phrase to the hen and feels very proud of his intelligence. Later, Chanticleer sees a fox. He starts to run, but the fox soothingly addresses Chanticleer and tells him not to be afraid. The fox flatters the rooster, saying he only came to the farmyard to hear Chanticleer's renowned voice. He asks Chanticleer if he can sing as well as his father, another famous rooster. Chanticleer immediately shuts his eyes and bursts into song. The fox rushes over, grabs him around the neck, and runs away with the rooster in his mouth. The hens rouse the household when they see what's happened, and the widow, her daughters, and all their other animals chase after the fox. The rooster suggests to the fox that he turn around and insult these bumpkins. And when the fox opens his mouth to agree, Chanticleer breaks away and flies to a treetop. The fox says, Alas, my Chanticleer, I fear I must have frightened you. I grabbed too hard. But, sir, I meant no harm. Come down and I'll explain what I intended. But Chanticleer responds, Curses on us both, and first on me if I were such a dunce as let you fool me oftener than once. The priest finishes his story by saying, 
Be on your guard against the flatterers of the world or yard. And if you think my story is absurd, a foolish trifle of a beast and bird, St. Paul himself, a saint of great discerning, says that all things are written for our learning. This animal fable is especially amusing as we see the animals take on human vanity and even intellectual pretense as when Chanticleer mistranslates some Latin to make a point to a hen. Next, we hear a story from a physician. There once lived a knight named Virginius. He had a beautiful daughter, as lovely in feature as she was in temper and virtue. She was only fourteen. She's never given a name in the tale, even though she's the main character. The physician takes a break from his story to remind the other pilgrims of the sacred duties of parenthood. He says that parents must teach by example and stay alert to their children's needs. He says, Shepherds too soft who let their duties sleep encourage wolves to tear the lambs and sheep. One day, a judge in the town near Virginius sees the beautiful girl. He determines to possess her and hires a criminal named Claudius to help him. Claudius accuses Virginius of having stolen a servant child of his and pretends the former servant is Virginius's daughter. Because he's a judge, the man who wants the girl makes a ruling that she must live with him as a ward of the court. Virginius goes home and tells his daughter that she's faced with either shame or death. Virginius knows that the judge has only the most lecherous intentions towards his daughter, who says to her father, Blessed be God that I should be a maid. I take my death rather than take my shame. Virginius cuts off his daughter's head and holding it by the hair brings it to the judge. The citizens knew the murder is due to the judge and throw him into prison. The judge's accomplice, Claudius, is hung and the knight is exiled. The physician finishes his story saying, Here one can see how sin is paid its wages. This story is probably based on a famous French epic poem that Chaucer translated. It has the air of martyrdom and morality that many of the tales do. The next tale comes from a man called the Pardoner. This may be hard for us to understand, but in Chaucer's time, people made a living selling pardons from sin. This was a bona fide job, and Pardoners would go to Rome to buy bags full of pardons and false relics. They would then sell these at a profit to those who hoped to buy their way into heaven, or at the very least, out of hell. This selling of pardons was the kind of Catholic Church corruption that led to the Protestant Reformation and to division within the Catholic Church itself. Here's how Chaucer describes the pardoner. Hair as yellow as wax, the same small voice a goat has got. His chin no beard would harbor. I judge he was a gelding or a mare. Here is the pardoner's story. It's the closest thing in the Canterbury Tales to a short story with its characters, plot, and suspense. In a tavern in Flanders, three young men sit drinking and gambling. They hear a bell, which means that a coffin is passing by. When they ask who died, a servant says it was a friend of theirs. The servant says, There came a privy thief. They call him Death, who kills us all round here. Death speared your friend through the heart, and then Death went his way without a word. He's killed a thousand in the plague. Be on your guard with such an adversary. Be primed to meet him everywhere you go. But the three drunken men, emboldened by youth and wine, decide to kill death. They leave the tavern and soon come upon a poor old man. They rudely remark on his age, saying, Isn't it time for you to die? The old man explains that he's wandered the world looking for someone who will exchange their youth for his age. He says, not even death, alas, will take my life. The young man asks him if he knows where death is. The old man says, If it be your design to find out death, turn towards that grove. I left him there today under a tree, and there you'll find him. When the three young men get to the tree, they find eight bushels of gold. They decide to wait for nightfall to move the gold, and send the youngest to town for food and wine. The two remaining men decide that they don't want to share the gold and will kill the third when he returns. 
The man who's gone to town decides that he wants all the money and puts poison in the wine that he purchases for the men he left behind. He comes back, and the two men stab him to death. Afterwards, they drink the poisoned wine. And thus, the three men meet death under the tree, as the old man said they would. As the pardoner finishes his tale, he says, Dearly beloved, God forgive your sin and keep you from the vice of avarice. My holy pardon frees you all of this, provided that you make the right approaches, that is, with sterling rings or silver brooches. So the story ends in ironic humor as the pardoner tries to peddle his wares to the pilgrims. This particular tale is considered one of the best. The pardoner, too, is one of the most interesting figures in the book. He's intelligent, crafty, and well-educated. His femininity distances him from some of the more vulgar stories that the other men tell. Also, he admits the hypocrisy of his livelihood, but he confesses that his love of money is something he can't put aside merely for the sake of virtue. The next story that we tell, and the last we have room for, is called The Wife of Bath's Tale. In the prologue, Chaucer describes her. A worthy woman from beside Bath City was with us, somewhat deaf, which was a pity. Her kerchiefs were of finely woven ground, bold was her face, handsome and red in hue. A worthy woman all her life. She had been thrice to Jerusalem. In company she liked to laugh and chat and knew the remedies for love's mischances, an art in which she knew the oldest dances. The wife of Bath says, If there were no authority on earth except experience, mine, for what it's worth, and that's enough for me, all goes to show that marriage is a misery and a woe. She's been married five times, and shared equal footing with all her husbands. The first three were old and rich, and each died not long after she established dominance in their relations. The fourth husband had a mistress, which she found very annoying because she wanted all his attention herself. She pretended to have an affair so that he would be annoyed and stop having one himself. After he died, she married a man half her age, a young man she loved very much. But this young man collected books that were filled with negative stories about women. When he began to read them aloud, she grabbed one of them and hit him with it. He hit her back, and she fell down and pretended to be dead. This upset the young man so much that he promised to do anything if she lived. And, as she had with all her other husbands, she finally had her way with her fifth husband. This is her story, which is shorter than her biography in the prologue. At the time of King Arthur, a knight raped a maiden. Arthur condemned him to death for the act of violence, but the queen asked if she could judge the knight. She told the knight that his life depended on him finding the answer to this question. What is the thing that women most desire? The knight had one year to get the answer. He set off, but no matter where he went or who he asked, he got a different response. After a year, he was despondent, without the answer that would save his life. Suddenly, in a wood, he saw a group of dancing maidens. As he approached, they disappeared, and before him was an extraordinarily ugly old woman. The old woman asked the knight what he sought, and he told her his story. She reassured him that she would give him the answer to the queen's question, but on one condition, that if she saved his life, he would do whatever she asked. The knight consented, and they went before the queen. He gave this answer. A woman wants the self-same sovereignty over her husband as over her lover. He must not be above her. That is your greatest wish. The women of the court agreed that the knight's answer was true. The old woman said that she had given it to him, and now he must keep his word and do what she asks. She asks him to be her husband. Although the knight wanted nothing less than to marry the old woman, he kept his word. But that night, as they go to bed, he won't touch her. She asks if this is how a knight treats his lady, and why he is so contemptuous of her. He says that she's old, ugly, poor, and low-bred. The old woman gives the knight an eloquent sermon about the Christian virtues of poverty and the gentility that comes from virtue, not birth. She says that because she's old and ugly, she'll be loyal and true and humble. 
She asks him, after describing all of the benefits of her gracious, if unglamorous, condition, what he wants. The knight takes a long time and finally says that the decision is hers. She says that since she has won the mastery to rule as she thinks fit, that he will find in her a wife both fair and faithful. And when the knight looks over, he sees that she is rich in charms and kissed her. The wife of Bath ends her tale. May Christ Jesus send us husbands meek and young and fresh in bed, and grace to overbid them when we wed. And, Jesus, hear my prayer, cut short the lives of men who won't be governed by their wives. The wife of Bath makes an unusual plea for women's rights in a time when they had virtually none. The wife of Bath has enjoyed her husbands and been faithful to them. She seeks only that her husbands not demand dominance. To make her point, in her tale a knight must go on a quest to learn that simple idea. A convicted rapist, he had to be threatened with death before he's even willing to consider what a woman wants. And the simple answer, which he only discovers by help from a magical witch, is that women want the same thing that men do, not to be dominated. This story and idea are a contrast to other stories in the Canterbury Tales and literature of that time. Most stories vilify women and made them out to be conniving shrews who lusted after every man that happened their way. Since we have virtually no literature from women to give perspective, we can only assume that the unflattering picture of women at that time was a result of the attitudes of the men, not a reflection of the actions of the women. There is a strange retraction at the end of the Canterbury Tales, where Chaucer says to the readers that he hopes the stories have pleased them. If anything in the tales displeased them, he begs forgiveness for his lack of ability, and says he would very gladly have written better if he had had the power to. But Chaucer has done quite well with his diverse cast of characters and his many stories. We see here more history than inspiration, and more color than substance. But in ending our synopsis of the Canterbury Tales, we quote from the wife of Bath as she humbly offers her story to the pilgrims. I hope the company won't reprove me, though I should speak as fantasy may move me. And please, don't be offended at my views. They're really only offered to amuse. This is the end of the session.